Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking the low, whoa, we're taking a look at me, I guess. <laughs> oh my. Hello, my name is Andrew Ray, AKA Binging with Babish, and I'm here to answer your questions via Twitter. This is Cooking Support. At ND Welch asks, why do they always use kosher salt in cooking videos? Well, I'll tell you, Nathan. There are really three salts that you need to know about. There is table salt, the one that you're probably most familiar with, kosher salt, and flaky finishing salt. I like to call table salt baking salt because that's really all I use it for because most recipes are developed using table salt. But that being said, it's not a great way to season your food when you're cooking because you can't pinch it. Kosher salt, on the other hand, you have complete control over. So you can see right now I have a big old pinch full of it and there's no salt coming out, for, out of my fingers until I start to twist my fingers from left to right. It's also a more forgiving salt. It's a bigger grain of salt. You're less likely to oversalt your food than you would be with table salt. And then this is the totally optional salt. These are very light, flaky. Ugh. Ah, really all you use it for is finishing. That's why it's called finishing salt. These two though, absolute necessities. Just know when to use them and why and how. All in, in all caps. People don't keep eggs in the fridge. Don't they go bad faster? As far as I understand, and please take what I'm saying with several grains of salt, because this is your food safety we're talking about here. And you shouldn't trust a guy who doesn't have food safety certification, never went to culinary school, went to film school, got really bad grades, and kind of lucked into his uh, job as a food influencer. You shouldn't be listening to me. The eggs that you need to refrigerate are ones that have been commercially washed. Here in the States, they wash eggs v with great rigor and that strips away the sort of natural protection on the outside of the shell, so they must be refrigerated. If you got them from the side of the road and they were not in the fridge, chances are they just came out of a hen's ass and they're ready to stay at room temperature in your stylish uh, barn converted backsplash kitchen. Anyway, that old Davy boy. Uh, cooking Twitter, what are some good knives that won't immediately break the bank? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I do have a line of cookware out, okay? It's called the Babish cookware line, all right? The, the, okay, these are German steel knives. They're full tang blades. They are 4116 German steel. They come sharp, they keep an edge, and they're 25 bucks, 25 to $30 per knife. That being said, I'm not here just to huck my cookware. Huck, is that the word? I'm not just here to sling cookware. I'm also gonna be fully honest about the other brands that I like. Victorinox Fibrox makes a great starter knife. It is stamped, not forged. Uh, likewise with Vustoff's Pro Line. It's so cheap, it's $20 for a knife. It's a great learning knife, it's a great starter knife. Uh, but these knives are great too. At Follower of Dole says, time to ask a chef. When I make fluffy scrambled eggs and cheese, fluffy is I tried to make an omelet and screwed it up. My dish is oily. I think it's oil from the cheese because the eggs are f cooked fully, but it's kind of butter, buttery flavor. It's good, but how to fix. So what I'm guessing you're doing is adding the cheese too early so it's getting too much heat from the pan. So it's going beyond the point of melting and it's breaking. When it breaks, it basically means that the, uh, the, the oil just seeps out of it. What I would do is try to add your cheese as late as humanly possible. Just don't overheat it and don't use cheeses that are too old. You know, use a Gruyere or a, a not too sharp, cheddar, pretty mild cheddar because they're better melters. They're gonna stand up to the heat better. Tablespoon and a half of butter in the pan. Eggs, always crack on a flat surface. Then, throw the pan back on the heat. Before it gets in the pan, I'm gonna beat these guys up. I'm gonna use the tiny whisk. They're more homogenous now, so now we're gonna add them to the pan. Keep them moving. Keep the pan moving, keep the eggs moving. You put this on toast and it's almost spread out. There we go, that's done. Irish cheddar. We'll put a fair amount in there. This is probably two ounces. Yeah, two ounces-ish. We're just mi mixing them in there, keeping them moving, and letting the residual heat in the pan melt the cheese and, and incorporate them into the egg. This is how I like my scrambled eggs. You might not like them this way. I like them creamy, I like them spreadable. And no matter how you like your scrambled eggs, if you add your cheese at the end and don't heat the cheese directly on the stovetop, you will notice that there is not a hint of oil or grease in this pan. It is just egg and cheese. Nothing has separated. And that's how you prevent cheese from breaking. Mm. At Duchess Woodall said, okay, what y'all season your ribeyes with? Salt and pepper, man. Salt and pepper. For the most part, you're just hitting it with salt and pepper. Maybe a sauce or something on the, on the back end. Steak seasonings, the shakers and all that stuff. 
not so much. B for Boss 9 says, People give me all of your advice on how to cook large slabs of meat so it won't dry out. The dog is now getting my three pound pork roast because I dried it out. A lot of things could be happening here. First off, you might be cooking it at too high a temperature. You might be just cooking it for too long. Pork you can cook to a rosy 135 if you know where the pork is from and if you trust it. Otherwise, cook it to 145. It's still gonna be nice and rosy and pink in the middle and it's gonna be super juicy. Something like a uh, uh, pork loin, which doesn't have much intramuscular fat, you need to be very careful to make sure that you're not overcooking it because that's how it dries out very fast. If you overcook it by 10 degrees, it's gonna be dry as a bone. You need to cook slowly, gently with big, big joints of meat. The best way to make prime rib, for example, is to cook it at like 250 degrees Fahrenheit for like six hours. Also, yeah, pull the meat 10 degrees shy of where you want it to end up. It will come up 10 more degrees at least when it comes out of the oven. At Hawaiian Sea Witch, if you're cooking shrimp, dot, 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 why do you leave the tails on? Why? It's so fun inconvenient when you're eating and you have to use your hands to pick off the tails to make sure you get all the shrimp out. Yes, I just recently had shrimp pasta and I'm mad about it. It is absolutely inconvenient. You're right to be mad about it. Uh, having shrimp tails on in pasta is ridiculous because if you don't want to eat with your hands, you're out of luck. You have to use your hands in some capacity if you've got shrimp tails on. That or you're, you're, or you're spitting them out like an olive pit which I don't think you wanna do in a fancy restaurant. So shrimp tails and pasta makes zero sense to me. I completely agree. That can really go f itself. From at Jim Kuras one. Are hashtag bay leaves a hoax? I've been cooking with them for 30 plus years and I'm not sure why. The only thing I know about them is that they're not actually supposed to be eaten. Hashtag cooking question. I personally, don't fully know what they're for either, these mysterious bastards. From what I understand, they're supposed to lighten up otherwise very heavy dishes like stews and braises. They also play really well with seafood. You're not supposed to eat them, obviously, but if you wanna see what they taste like, yeah, it's just got, yeah, it's a minty, almost basil-y. <laughs> Yeah, you're not supposed to eat them, but they do play really well in stews and braises. And if they are a hoax, they're the weirdest hoax I've ever heard of, because these things cost like 99 cents a ton. Jill Bean, AKA at Jilly Bean. Hardest fruit to cut? Mango. Anyone beg to differ? Come prove me wrong. Hashtag struggling. Is there a harder fruit to cut? Nope, I just ran through the entire list of fruits in my head. Uh, mango is a very difficult fruit to cut. You could, Peel it first, but I like to just kind of go at it, kind of like an avocado. You want to try to get really as close to the pit as possible. It's thinner than you think. Same thing on the other side. Really straddle the pit. You're going to want to very carefully <laughs> score this guy. You see that sort of spread apart mango action. And now that you've spread it open like this, you can just kind of chop it out. Try not to take it in the skin with you, but you can just sort of slice it off there. If I had to sum up the technique, it's like a modified avocado. With the avocado, of course, you remove the pit. For this, you have to be just a little bit more, you know, ready to lose some fruit and ready to just have some weird oblong pieces like this guy. Megan Spencer at The Real Megan S. At Binging with Babish. This one's actually for me. At Binging with Babish, I've tried your bagel recipe from Steven Universe twice now, and they don't brown up as much as yours and are only bubbly and brown on parts that touch the baking sheet. I have a traditional oven, not a convection. Do I need to be baking at higher than 425 Fahrenheit? I would say that's a good place to start. Another really important thing would be to make sure that the rack in your oven is in the right spot. If they're only browning on the bottom, I'm guessing your rack is towards the bottom of the oven. Especially if you have an electric oven that has the heating element on the bottom, they're getting blasted with heat on the bottom, but not so much on the top. So if you put that rack in the top third of your oven, uh, that's going to get a lot more radiant heat off the top of your oven, bouncing down onto the bagels. It's gonna help brown them more efficiently. They definitely do brown better with a convection oven, but you can still make amazing bagels without convection. Another great thing to try is the home steam oven method, which is to place a heat proof dish or skillet underneath the, in the rack below the one that you're gonna be baking on. Let it preheat with your oven, let it get nice and hot. And then when you put the bagels in the oven, pour some boiling water into that vessel, whatever it is, and that's gonna generate a whole lot of steam in your oven, which is going to allow your bagels to rise more before they start to form a crust, before they start to brown. That's gonna give you not only a better oven spring, it's gonna give you a better crust. So try moving your, your oven rack up to get more heat coming down from the top and try the oven steam method. Let me know how it goes. Tag me. Goddess Betty Jane at Bye Betty 2 What do you think is the worst food you could eat in the tub? 
Biscotti wasn't a great idea, but I'm com contemplating leftover pad thai. Both terrible ideas. Uh, I totally agree. Bad ideas. Anything crummy or saucy. Pad thai would, would be not great, but I think a worse one would be any kind of red sauce. A croissant would be terrible to eat in a, in a, in a bath, especially when you have a beard. It's just a croissant catcher. I think the moral of the story is here, you know, keep uh, only eat corn dogs in the bath. It's portable, one hand. I really think that corn dogs are, are the best bathtub food. And apples, if you're trying to be healthy. At Matty S. Carpenter says, is there something about zesting a lemon that I don't understand or are we all just ending up with uh, the lemon stuck in the grater. You're not imagining anything. That's absolutely what happens. I like a rasp style grater like this one. This allows the lemon to fall out a little bit more freely. First off, you don't wanna, you don't wanna grate too close to the pith. You just want the outermost layer of the lemon. You don't want the white stuff underneath. The stuff directly on the outside, just the zest, that's where the lemon flavor is. It's sweet, it's mild, it's not bitter. You're still gonna end up with a whole bunch stuck in there, but all you gotta do, well, that's it. No big deal. Sarah, at S-O teach me. Question, when cooking risotto, a glug or a gluggle of wine is a correct and appropriate measure, right? Absolutely. Risotto is a very Im imprecise process. It's something that you really need to sort of feel out. If you put a half a bottle of wine in there or half a cup of wine in there, it's still gonna taste good. And a glug is a great way to do it. Generally with like a, you know, a standard batch of risotto, I'm putting like a cup of white wine in there. So I would say more of a gluggle than a glug, cause that's like a maybe four glugs. And I, I would call that a gluggle. That sounds like a, a gaggle of glugs. At Security Sphinx asks, what is the best cocktail garnish and why is it a Luxardo cherry? I completely agree with you, it is a Luxardo cherry. Why is it a Luxardo cherry? Because Luxardo cherries are worth every penny of the like freaking $20 that a jar costs. They are rich, they don't taste cloyingly sweet, they have the perfect texture to them. They're not mushy, but they have, they have a little bit of a snap. The syrup is dark and rich and sweet and, 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 and luxuriant. And I always like to use it in my old fashions as my simple syrup, because it's very, very sweet and it adds that wonderful Luxardo flavor to my cocktail. So absolutely the best cocktail garnish, 100%, unless we're talking about Bloody Marys, in which case everything's the best cocktail garnish. <laughs> Vossen888 asks, lately I've been cooking a lot with onions and wowee. The thing about them making you cry is not a joke. Does anyone have any solutions to this problem? I've tried running them underwater a bit, doesn't work. I think I'm um, thinking more like the onion goggles Phil wears in Modern Family. That is really is like the only solution is uh, go onion goggles. Like the, the, that's the thing, wear your swimming goggles and those will work fine. There's really not any other way. Maddie Matheson attests that it's, you need a sharp knife, which there's something to that because the sharper your knife is, the fewer cell walls in the onion you're rupturing. So it should in theory not make you cry as much, but it also just totally depends on the onion. I think fridging them might help. Like I've always fridged my onions and I feel like they've made me cry less than most other people's onions. Wear some goggles if you wanna be a dork about it. Otherwise, you know, suck it up and get it over with as fast as possible without chopping off a finger. At Good Luck Grunge. What is the best sandwich? I'm thinking it's gotta be the homemade BLT sandwich with mayo. Truly food of the gods. I love a BLT. It is one of the simplest sandwiches you can get. However, I can't say it's the best sandwich. My favorite sandwich is very close to the Liz Lemon, which is, you know, you got some pastrami, you got some turkey, you got some coleslaw, Russian dressing, potato chips. You got a lot of crunch in there. I think that even a BLT can be improved though. You could throw a runny egg on there. You could throw a slice of, of cheese on there, a little bit of Gruyere or something like that. A nice, fresh, crisp lettuce, toast the inside of your bread. This is what you should take away from my long-winded, meandering answer. Toast the inside of your bread, not the outside. It will spare the roof of your mouth, but you'll get all the crunch and all the flavor, and it will prevent your bread from getting soggy. And to me, that's a better BLT. It's BLT plus good. At Caden Bop asks, how often do we really need to sharpen knives when cooking? How often do you, binging with Babish, that's me. Is it like after each use, like some people, or should it be more like once a week or even a month? Definitely the latter. Uh, you don't need to sharpen it after each use. Depends on how often you're cooking. If you're cooking for yourself every night, every meal, yeah, once a week, you're probably gonna wanna give it a sharpen. If you're, if cooking's more of a hobby, if you're cooking on the weekends, I mean, I sharpen them probably once a month. It also depends on the knife you have. If your knife doesn't hold an edge very long, you need to sharpen it more often. 
um, likewise with a honing rod. Lots of folks think that this is a knife sharpener. Not so, this is a honing rod. Your blade not only needs to be kept sharp, it needs to be kept straight. So use the honing rod to straighten out your edge. Not gonna make your knife sharp, but it's going to help your knife perform. Maybe get one of those little hand sharpeners to tide you over, and then once every few months, get it professionally sharpened or use a whetstone if you are a crazy person like me and have uh, several whetstones. At Women Enjoy Beer, uh, asks cooking substitution question. Can I sub evaporated milk for coconut milk? I'm not entirely sure. It really depends on what you're making. Uh, in baking especially, I can't recommend that you do that. I can't imagine that they interact the same way in baked goods. I can definitely imagine situations where you could swap them out, but it's gonna totally depend on what you're making. And I'm sorry I don't have a, a more information there. You guys should have asked an actual expert. At Mandel Organa, let's start this discourse because Cicely and I, whoever Cicely is, uh, need answers. Who in Star Wars would be a good cook? That's a great question. Let's run down the list, okay? Leia, I don't think so, because she is a boss general. She doesn't have time to cook. Luke, uh, I, I, I could see him cooking, but it would be like gross Yoda stuff. It'd be root leaf stew out in the woods in the weird island planet where he lives. I don't think he cares that much about food. I think food is more of like a survival, like, like sustenance thing for him. Han, no way. Darth Vader, no. He's getting his nutrients through a tube or some weird, he's eating electricity or something. Chewie, maybe. I mean, he's the, one of the few people that has cooked in the movies. It's like from the Star Wars Christmas special, there is like a whole cooking segment. I think it was um, stewed bantha or something like that. Hey guys, thank you so much for all the amazing questions. Thank you Wired for having me. This has been Cooking Support.